Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Brought to you by Killer Podcasts and Evergreen Podcasts Network. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. It's the show that takes you inside the unbelievable, the unexplainable, the macabre, and the bizarre and tries to find an answer. Hi, Caroline. Hi. How are you today? How are you? It's your birthday. It is. We are recording this on my 34th birthday, which means I've now beaten both Alexander and Christ at the great game of life. Yeah, I guess in a way. So that's <laughs> so that's where I'm standing today at 34 <laughs> years old. Mm. Um, and I would love to talk, Caroline, um, on this day as I get closer to death. Let's let's oh, talk. Boy. Let's talk about it because it's obviously. Um, filling my mind uh, already dad yeah it's my birthday that's what that's what birthdays are after you're about 30 years old great so um i wanted to talk this week about a not a particular death not a particular murderer but a uh, tool a tool of death and uh often a tool of revolution caroline this podcast is going to be about madame la guillotine mrs guillotine the guillotine Oh, why is it a madame? Um, th- that was the nickname that it was uh, often referred to, personified as during the French Revolution. Like when, a ship? Um, yeah, I guess kind of the, the way a ship is always a woman, yeah. Hmm. Am I supposed to find that problematic now, these days? Or do we not, are ships not women anymore? I don't know. It doesn't matter. If you tell me, if you tell me they're not, it's okay. But <laughs> um, Madame la Guillotine. Um, our listeners probably are familiar with the guillotine. Hopefully not in a hands-on fashion. Hopefully not. There uh, are not that many guillotinings these days, and we'll get into that later. But the guillotine is maybe the most um, recognizable symbol of the French Revolution and the great reign of terror uh, that extended through the, the last bloody years of it. Mm-hmm. And... Um, as an extension of that, it's kind of become a symbol of um, whether, you know, depending on how you look at it, um, revolutionary overreach or, ev- or revolutionary justice, depending on who's the one uh, erecting the guillotine in that particular year in that particular place. Yeah, I see references on Twitter uh, a lot yeah, those... nowadays about uh, guillotining the rich. Well, we should uh, we should. Really take a good look at history before we put the cart on the ho- uh, before the horse and start setting up guillotines in the public square. And maybe uh, this week is a, a nice opportunity to do that. Yeah, I guess. Because sometimes it doesn't work out that well after you set up that guillotine and decide you're just going to start chopping. Mm-hmm. It might interest you to know, Carrie, the guillotine was originally devised as a more humane way of killing. Um, but we'll get to that in just a little while. Um, The guillotine itself is not the first, the guillotine you associate with the French Revolution, you can picture it, our viewers picturing it, listeners picturing it right now. Mm -hmm. Um, It's uh, a wooden bottom with a wooden frame and uh, like a sheet metal kind of blade and you drop it from the top and it goes to the bottom and it cuts your head off. It has an angled blade running between two kind of grooves carved into two uh, tall uprights. Mm -hmm. At the bottom of those uprights is a hinged yoke to hold someone's head in place and then uh, down comes the blade. It's at a nice an angle so it cuts through nice and uh, the person's head falls right off into a basket execution over. Ideally, yes. Um, The guillotine itself was not the first Um, head chopping machine. It's not the first, the French didn't invent the head chopping machine. Mm -hmm. Um, There are references in literature to similar uh, machines, at least back into the 1200s. But we know of several actual working um, head chopping machines (laughs) in Britain in uh, the 1500s. First, the uh, Halifax gibbet, (laughs) <laughs> which was in use in Halifax, West Yorkshire, England for, um, I think, at least 100 years. No one's really sure when it was actually put in. Um, this was an axe head mm-hmm. that the village had fitted to the base of a heavy wooden block. And then they set that between, you know, it would slide down grooves carved along two 15-foot tall um, wooden columns. And there was a rope lifting the wooden block with a pulley. The rope would be pinned to the uprights, and then you would either pull that pin out or just chop the rope to let the axe blade fall and chop the prisoner's head off. Uh, That was the preferred method of execution for petty thieves in Halifax. 
So this is presumably so no one would have to act the role of executioner? Um, well, there's lots of reasons. I think one, but what was, the thing is someone still does have to act as an executioner. Right. They just cut a rope now instead of... <laughs> um, I, I think there's a lot of things to recommend the guillotine uh, type machine over the uh, the the axe or the sword, but uh, we can we can talk about the mechanics of it in in just a, just a little bit here. Um, Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell, by the way, forbade the use of the Halifax gibbet and, in fact, the beheading of petty criminals in 1650 when the Puritans were taking over. Um, but 90 to 100 people were executed between the first execution in Halifax in 1286 and um, the last one in 1650. But it's not clear when the gibbet was built. So um, at some point, those executions changed from either a sword or an axe to uh, this big old machine. Um, if you go to Halifax, West Yorkshire, England now, there is a non-working replica of the Halifax <laughs> gibbet on that site that was built in 1974. You can take a nice photo op there. It also has a plaque respectfully bearing the names of a few dozen people who were known to have been beheaded with the machine. Hmm. Um, it may not surprise you, it didn't surprise me, uh, to hear that the Scottish had their own twist on the, uh, the head chopping machine. Well, everyone's got their own brand. And this one, the Scottish Maiden, it's called, is actually on display right now at the National Museum of Scotland. You can go see the original one. Um, legend has it, it was directly inspired by the Halifax gibbet. Um, <laughs> but instead of a wooden block, they had 75 pounds of lead weights to, uh, propel the blade down. Oh, I was gonna say. Oh, instead of a blade? Uh, yeah. I was like, oh, that's horrible. <laughs> that would be a bummer. Crushing your neck. Yeah, no, but this was, but it was, is just, I think an ax blade at the bottom. So you would think it's not going to stay super, super sharp hopefully they they sharpen it regularly we hope so um usually executioners you can pay a little extra like if it's a queen and you're henry the eighth or whatever and you want to give some dignity to the death you can pay for them to use a sword which is usually a little better um so they're not just hacking away with a dull axe yeah um although to me, I've been thinking about this while I've been researching this episode. I think I'd rather have an axe take my head off. We, we'll talk about other execution methods in a little bit here. Okay. The, the um, Scottish Maiden killed 150 people, chopping their heads off between mid the mid-1500s and 1710 when it was finally taken down. Um, this one, you said, why, would, you know, why did you build this instead of using a sword? Apparently, the Scottish Maiden was built because the sword that the town of Edinburgh had been using to execute its prisoners um, was just worn down and worn out. And they were like, well, we, we can't use this anymore. And so they borrowed a sword from a nearby town for a little while. And then they were just like, oh, fuck this. And they, they uh, <laughs> paid some local craftsmen like a couple pounds to uh, design and build a head chopping machine like they had up in Halifax. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but the guillotine itself has its origins, again, in the... Bloody days of the French Revolution. And so that's where we're going to go now. The guillotine is named after Joseph Ignace Guillotin. 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 Is it spelled the same way? Uh, there's no E at the end. It's G-U-I-L-L-O-T-I-N. And I think I, I think I kind of nailed that pronunciation. Guillotin. Uh, Guillotin was a French politician and physician from Paris, born 1738. And... Um, he was already a well-known Parisian doctor about town and <laughs> Freemason uh, when he got into politics, and he first made, made a name for himself, I found this interesting, as part of a royal commission to investigate mesmerism. Man, they used to have all the best jobs back then. Well, Louis Mesmer was making some pretty crazy claims about what he could do for people's health and mental well-being. And um, so the and then they they partnered up with John Crapper and decided to <laughs> investigate. What is this? So the king uh, put together a commission to investigate these mesmeric powers. Um, it's the same kind of stuff that would evolve into modern hypnotism, though. Mesmerism. Um, so that's how Guillotin had made a name for himself. And in October 1789, Guillotin was a representative to the National Constituent Assembly of France. Um, just a, the briefest of backgrounds on the way the revolution is playing out here. Mm -hmm. um, in spring of 1789, Guillotin had been a representative to the Third Estate of the Estates General, which was like a sort of a parliament kind of thing that the king had to call just when he felt like it. The estates hadn't been called since 1614. 
mm-hmm. in 1789 when the king found out like nobody was going to do what he wanted until he called the sort of kind of parliament that was non-binding. Um, when they all got together, the third estate, which was the 98% of the population, 24 million people representatives, which had the same votes as the other two estates. Mm. Um, not It wasn't a great system for like most of the people. So the third estate kind of uh, said, ah, screw this. We're the National Assembly now. And they left and they made themselves the government. And because that, there were more of them. Because there were more of them. Because there were more of them. Well, they had, um, yeah, they had twice the number of delegates, although that didn't matter in the voting because you still voted first estate, second estate, third estate. Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> the first estate being the clergy and the second estate being all of the nobility. So those two would pair off. Yeah, and they would just say, okay, um, for example, we don't have to pay any taxes. You guys still have to pay all the taxes like has been happening. Uh, and then they voted down. Okay, uh, church, yes. Nobles, yes. People, no. All right, well, the people lose that one. Um, so the people said, screw this, we're just going to leave. Um, partly because actually the nobles and church didn't even want to all meet in the same room. They said, let's all discuss stuff separately, send our votes in. Over and, Zoom. Yeah, over Zoom, and we'll be good. We'll work <laughs> from home. And uh, so the third estate walked out. They said, well, well yeah, screw this. And then uh, the king tried to put a stop to that. Then a bunch of Parisians stormed the Bastille and killed the governor. And what's the Bastille for anyone who doesn't know? Uh, the Bastille was a medieval fortress and sort of a prison. At this time, it actually only had like, I mean, angry Parisians stormed it going like, free the prisoners, free our, the brothers of our revolution and stuff. And there were like seven guys in there who were mostly forgers. Was it kind of a Tower of London? Yes, it was sort of a Tower of London, but also a military fortress that was the governor's like headquarters mm-hmm. and had a big, sizable cache of guns and uh, ammunition. Mm. And that's what the people wanted because uh, they had decided the king was going to disperse the National Assembly. And it was very important the people defend it. It was kind of a um, Lexington and Concord situation Mm -hmm. except in lexington and concord nobody murdered the governor bit of a difference yeah when the parisians were finally let into the bastille they uh lynched a few of the guards and then dragged governor delaunay back to the hotel de ville uh, which is the city hall of paris they beat (laughs) just beating the shit out of him like all the way Mm -hmm. um they got to outside the the city hall and delaunay parisians are above him going like what do we do with him huh (laughs) I say we kill him here. No, he must stand trial. Then we kill him. French listeners, uh, we love you and appreciate you. (laughs) And Delaunay uh, said like, enough, let me die. And kicked one of the guys in the dick. Oh, like a pastry chef. He kicked him in the groin. And so then the angry Parisians and their knives and swords obliged him. And he died right there outside of what is still today Paris's city hall. If you want to get someone to murder you, kicking them in a dick is not a bad option. Um, So that was how this new government had gotten started. I just want to set the tone for for where we are in the French Revolution. Um, And then the assembly got to the good work of trying to make new laws that would improve the lives of the people of Paris, which no one had done in a very long time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. In the assembly, um, Guillotin, who was obviously very interested in um, health matters as a doctor, uh, was the first chair of the health committee of the new government and uh, he was an outspoken opponent you might find this ironic outspoken opponent of capital punishment Hmm. Um, his speeches for abolishing the death penalty uh, which he made often and loudly in the convention fell on totally deaf ears and no one was really interested except the most liberal of uh, you know representatives do you think he'd be bummed out about his legacy I know that he is. We'll talk about his uh, his oh, reaction you talk to, to him? it. Oh, I see. Yeah, he survived long enough to regret the guillotine. I see. I uh, thought you whipped out our Ouija board. <laughs> um, we can do that on a bonus episode. <laughs> um, Guillotin is of Guillotin course. Guillotin spills the tea. <laughs> he is of course most remembered for October tenth, seventeen eighty nine when he introduced a bill insisting that all executions henceforth be carried out by decapitation with a decapitation machine. Okay, specifically. Yes, he said a machine for beheading people. (laughs) And by the way, have I got a machine for you. Now, for Guillotin, this was a baby steps thing. He felt that this was, you know, an incremental first step. Let's make executions less horrible, and then we can hopefully get towards eliminating them altogether. Yeah, because if we recall, I think I might have spoken about it a little bit on our Salem Witch Trials episode. If not, 
I'm doing it now. Um, hanging was kind of the the way to do it, unless you were being beheaded by an executioner with an axe, which of course could take several whacks. Well, there were they, actually many different colorful uh, methods in, in sure. pre-revolutionary France. Well, there were a lot of like torture, drawing, quartering type of thing. Because but hanging, you would just like hang there and choke to death, and it was a very horrible way to die. Yeah, they um, sometime in the 1860s, some scientists actually figured out that uh, you want about four to six feet of drop to make sure the neck snaps at the end of the rope. They call it the standard drop. And it's kind of the hallmark of humane, quote unquote, modern hangings. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is obviously way before then. So we're talking about, yeah, a box or a stool being pushed out from under your feet. Surprise. <laughs> Maybe if you're lucky, you're pushed off like a scaffold. And um, then you strangle to death. Yeah, over... It's a horrible way to go. Between several and sometimes 20 minutes. Yeah, so there's that. uh, And there's an executioner who, again, did he have a little too much to drink the night before? He might get your top of your hair or, you know, the top of your skull, uh, your back, instead of the designated place that he's supposed to chop. Well, this is why I would... To return to that uh, earlier, this is why I would much rather have an axe than a, a sword. I feel like you want the weight behind that blow. You want the axe to be sharp, but I want my neck to be split. I don't want a sword to go halfway through the bone because the guy didn't swing it right. If you have a big, heavy axe and you put it in the right place, I'm confident it's going to get the job done. And Sean knows his axes <laughs> after four well, episodes. Yeah, we, we, I read a lot about axes. <laughs> um, and, and, you, and you said, you know what? I think I'll go for this. Now, that said, um, the axe or the sword probably wouldn't have been an option for us, Carrie, um, because only nobles committed of capital crimes had the honor of decapitation by sword in medieval France. Right, because it was better than hanging Uh, and torture and whatever. And as you said, most people convicted of capital crimes uh, were hanged, which was is the is and has been for since rope was invented, (laughs) the uh, standard way of uh, organized murder. That's a lovely way to put it. It's what it is. Mm-hmm. However, some serious crimes had more creative punishments. And in pre-revolutionary France, um, as I said, it varied by your class, um, but also by your crime and, and just colorful local tradition. Um, in some places, counterfeiters could be boiled to death. Oh, God. Um, of course, as we know, Carrie, burning is your European classic for witches, gay people, uh, heretics... European never happened in America. Uh, that's true. Yeah, we hanged witches here. Um, Go USA. Witch burnings and uh, and such weren't being pulled out so much in the uh, late 1700s, but sometimes you have to dust off a classic, and it was still on the books for some crimes. Um, parasides, that would be people killing their parents. Regicides, that would be killers of kings. And traitors were traditionally killed by being pulled apart with uh, four horses. Mm-hmm. You just tie a limb to each one and uh, slap those things on the ass. Not a great, not a great move. No. And bandits and murderers who didn't get lucky enough to have the standard hanging uh, could instead be broken on the wheel Ugh. to make an example of them. Now, what is breaking on the wheel, Sean? Yeah. So, um, lots of medieval towns, pretty much all medieval towns, had a breaking wheel that they kept in the middle of town. And this was a big cartwheel that they kept for this purpose. Um, A cartwheel like you would put on a very large cart. And in fact, even if the village didn't have a cart large enough for that wheel, God, did they have that wheel. They had it hanging up right in the town square. Because the criminal would be tied, spread out on the cartwheel. um, I just realized that's where the word cartwheel comes from. Yes. (laughs) It sure is. I just never thought about it. Yeah, you look like... Tied a cartwheel. Tied spread out on the cartwheel, mm-hmm. um, which was then slowly revolved uh, because the executioner that way doesn't have to move around so much. He's just standing in one place and he's holding a heavy hammer mm. uh, or iron bar and just bringing it down to smash your limbs, hitting the places between the spokes of the wheels to make sure for the maximum pressure and distance of the bone to move. Um, absolutely shattering the limbs and hitting each place more than once. Um, The executioner may or may not be ordered to eventually give the mercy of a coup de grace to the face or head. 
Um, a lot of the time, the victim would just linger for days. And they're just basically mush tied to a wheel at this point. Yeah, and birds and Ugh. rats and insects kind of eat them a little bit, and they die of shock or dehydration over the course of, yeah, a few days. Um, if you were very lucky as a French prisoner, uh, you could receive a retentum. What's that? It was a ritual strangling which would be the executioner would be ordered to administer after just the second or third blow um, or even before the whole breaking starts. So basically everyone's still seeing the effects of a breaking, but it's not as inhumane. That's true. And sometimes with any of the above executions, discreetly, with a particularly well-liked prisoner or a very merciful judge or executioner, or even the bribe going into the right place, mm -hmm. the prisoner would just be strangled secretly beforehand, and then all of this would be done to their body. Yeah, they'd be weekend at Bernie's. Yes, uh, <laughs> through the oh, breaking no. wheel. Oh, no, oh, no, flailing. Oh, and it's... I hear him crying <laughs> now, I do. <laughs> um. In the face of all this, you can see why um, Joseph Ignatius de Guillotin thought his de Guillotin, sorry, thought his legislation a reasonable first baby step toward the abolition of capital punishment. Well, it's definitely better. So, his bill of October 10th, 1789 proposed the following. First, same crime, same punishment. We no longer pay attention to class and nobles won't be treated differently from peasants. Second, Capital punishment will always be performed as decapitation by a machine designed to decapitate people. Third, no legal penalties are allowed for the families of the guilty. And fourth, no confiscating the property of the guilty. And if you do cut their heads off, you have to return their bodies to their families. I mean, it's a big, big jump. He was very excited talking about this in the assembly, and um, the papers all printed his quote where he said he, he was like almost manic, it seems. He was like, now with my machine, I cut your head off in the twinkling of an eye. You never feel it. <laughs> this is me talking about true crime at a party and everyone like, oh, she's a little weird. Um, now, he actually had very little to do with the design and nothing to do with the construction of the guillotine. But because he had proposed the idea, uh, Guillotin's name was forever tied to it. <laughs> so he basically said, yeah, it has to be a machine. Can someone make this machine, please? Um, yeah, well, <laughs> here's the thing. It was going through the National Assembly, and the French Revolution had a committee for everything. So this was always going to be a design by committee. Mm. And thus we come to the proceedings of the Beheading Machine Committee. Um, <laughs> Surgeon Antoine Louis... Was, pr was the presiding member. Uh, Guillotin was on the committee, but Louis is usually credited with the final design mm -hmm. of the machine. Um, it was influenced explicitly by the Halifax gibbet and the Scottish maiden, um, which both used as a hinged yoke to hold the head in place, and uh, they both used a heavy crescent-shaped blade descending to cut the head off. Um, they brought in a German engineer named Tobias Schmidt, because just like with razors and automobiles, I guess you want <laughs> German engineering in your head chops. Yeah, I mean, they know sharp metal. Um, Schmidt was actually a harpsichord maker by trade, so this was a uh, bit of a departure for him. I love making harpsichords and chopping people's heads off. Um, now, legend has it that Louis XVI himself, who was an amateur locksmith and fascinated by machines, uh, suggested to the convention that a very sharp angled blade rather than a heavy curved blade uh, would ensure that any neck would be able to be cut with this machine insert obvious irony for louis the 16th oh boy yeah madame la guillotine devoured her first victim on april 25th 1792 he was nicolas jacques pelletier a highwayman who was arrested for killing and robbing a stranger walking home along with some buddies they like ambushed this guy and then reports actually differ, but they either robbed or robbed and killed or robbed and raped the guy. Highway robbers. That was in October. Pelletier was sentenced to death in December. The execution was stayed when beheading was declared the only means of capital punishment allowed in France. And then Pelletier waited in jail for three more months <laughs> while the guillotine was designed and built by the head chopping committee. On his execution day, the guillotine was placed on a large scaffold outside L'Hôtel de Ville. Lafayette brought in the National Guard. Oh, Marquis de Lafayette was the commander of the National Guard at this point for uh, American Revolution fans. Lafayette! 
to uh, they were brought in to make sure the presumably large crowd wouldn't get too rowdy because people in France and uh, across Europe until the 1800s basically loved a public execution. Sure did. And people in this case didn't really get rowdy, but it was a big crowd and there was a lot of hype. There, the hype machine was strong around the first guillotining. <laughs> um, Pelletier was read to, led to a scaffold wearing a red shirt. The guillotine was painted red as well. Um, I don't know if that's to kind of lessen the impact of all the blood splashing around or, or what, it, what it is, but that's what they did. Um, he was placed in the correct position within seconds of climbing the scaffold. The blade fell and the crowd was disappointed. They actually started a chant of bring back our wooden gallows. Oh no. Because this was just not the entertainment that they were used to. It was over too quick. There was no buildup and there was no pain. Yeah, terrible, boo. So it actually, it didn't like get rioty, but it, it was, the crowd was very audibly disappointed by the first guillotine. How gruesome. How, what a bummer for humanity, right? Yeah. From that moment on, though, the guillotine was the only legal civil execution method in France until France ad- abolished the death penalty, as Guillotin had wanted, in 1981. That's very recent yeah the last person uh executed by a country by guillotine was in france in 1977 that's after the godfather came out <laughs> yeah it, it sure is <laughs> that's like a good amount after the beatles broke up yeah but maybe it's worth discussing now it is better than a lot of other ways to kill if you're going to execute people yeah i mean listen i haven't heard the rest of this episode so maybe you're gonna be like and then there were these terrible accidents um but yeah you hear about that all the time with lethal injection certainly the electric chair was monstrous so so far this makes sense (laughs) um a note on guillotin actually and 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 factoring into that he as i said was later somewhat horrified by his own machine after he heard um, some scientific speculation that the human head may stay alive for a few seconds or even some said up to a minute after the head was actually chopped. Yeah. And if that was the case, all of a sudden, Guillotin did not know if uh, what he had done was the right thing after all. He spent the rest of his life campaigning aggressively against the death penalty. Um, Well, he wanted that in the first place. Um, yes, he did. Um, but I, I think he also got heavily on board with vaccines, which were invented uh, shortly after this. But, but um, that's what he spent most of his time doing. Some people will tell you that uh, guillotine, guillotine was ironically guillotined at the end of the revolution. That's actually just a rumor, although he was imprisoned by the Revolutionary Tribunal because he wouldn't hand over another guy's wife and kids. The other guy had just been guillotined. He seems like a pretty stand-up guy. Oh, I, I think he was a great person yeah cool but he didn't get murdered he didn't but huh. lots of other people would yeah um you see by 1791 to check back in with that revolution mm. um the national assembly had declared a constitutional monarchy okay so Lu- louis still doing all right louis still doing all right he was not happy with this and his only power in the new government was a suspensive veto he could veto a law but then if the legislature passed it three more times <laughs> Better than being dead, Louis. Um, it, it was, but he didn't uh, seem to understand. And he and his wife did everything they could to uh, uh, try to uh, push things back the other way. And who was his wife? Uh, Marie Antoinette, who was the most unpopular person in France at this point and had been for several years. Yeah, if you remember our um, Renaissance Poisons episode, we talk about the affair of the necklace a bit. That definitely helped kick off a lot of the hatred towards her, and it did not get better. She was emblematic of, I mean, the royal family was very bad for, this royal family was very bad for France and spent all of their money frivolously. And that didn't just mean expensive jewelry and clothes and stuff. But her expensive jewelry and clothes and stuff were a symbol for the nation yes. as they were all starving in the in the streets kind of thing. Didn't say let them eat cake. That actually is, yeah, never happened. But, I mean, she might as well have yes. <laughs> with how she was dressed and, and all that. But again, she was imported to be queen. This is all she had raised, been raised to do. Um, it's all she knew. And uh, it's not like she had any real power. So I uh, feel bad for her. Well, she bribed a bunch of officials into um, making sure the new constitution only gave uh, votes to a very small number of citizens. 
and to make sure that uh, Louis got that vote, veto uh, power, which Louis then used to um, shut down several very, 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 very popular, like all of the country wanted them kind of popular measures. And then there was another armed insurrection and the constitutional monarchy was overthrown less than a year after it had started. Yeah. The National Convention was elected to replace it. And in 1792, the National Convention was facing a war that immediately started going very badly against Prussia and the Holy Roman Empire because Mm -hmm. the other European powers didn't like all this anti-monarchy talk. Yeah, well, one revolution usually begets another. That's right. They were also facing hundreds of thousands of armed peasants and priests uprising in the rural Vendée region, which was like the breadbasket. It's the Midwest of France. That's their (laughs) breadbasket. Okay. Um, And they were also watching angry mobs across Paris continuing to harass, beat, and lynch people they deemed counter-revolutionary or sympathetic to the royal family. And that was just by their own choice. It's Um, not like they were tried. Um, the ro- who the royal family? No, the people that they were beating up and oh, of course, <laughs> killing and you know that's how mob justice works. Yeah, there yeah. were there were lynchings happening in the streets, and so to deal with suspected traitors and counter revolutionaries in a tidier and more <laughs> organized way, an upstart and very liberal uh, politician, a young lawyer from the country named Maximilian Robespierre. Uh, suggested that a provisional revolutionary tribunal be formed to expedite some of this justice that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. The tribunal was formed August 17th. It lasted until November and handed out 28 guilty sentences and guillotined 28 prisoners. Mm -hmm. Not too bad. Uh, It could be worse. It was certainly not as bad as the massacres that were going on in Paris in September of that year. Um, One of Robespierre's allies, Jean-Paul Marat, he was a a journalist, a very fiery journalist in Paris and a a bit of a politician now and currently head of the Paris Committee of Surveillance. There was a committee for everything in the French Revolution. (laughs) Marat organized mobs of National Guardsmen and apparently some criminals, to just open up all the prisons and murder all political prisoners before the king got a chance to supposedly launch his coup. Oh, God. So in comparison to the 28 guillotined by the uh, First Revolutionary Tribunal, 1,100 to 1,600 people, half the prisoners in Paris at that time, were stabbed, beaten to death, and otherwise just pulled apart by mobs in late September. Yeah, give me the guillotine. Uh, 17% of those were non-juring priests, as they were called, priests who wouldn't take a civic oath of loyalty to the nation above God, uh, which is what they were asking priests to do at this point. Um, Up to 80% of the people were not politically active at all and were just common criminals and other prisoners, um, including many women and children. Mm. That was the September massacres. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously there were a lot of questions left about what France was going to be after the insurrections of the previous August and the destruction of the monarchy. And one of those questions that remained, and we will get to it after the break, is what they were going to do about Louis XVI, now known as Citizen Louis Capet. What indeed? You know what they're going to do. Yeah, they're going to cut off his head. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Burn the Boats from Evergreen Podcasts. I interview political leaders and influencers, folks like award-winning journalist Soledad O'Brien and conservative columnist Bill Kristol about the choices they confront when failure is not an option. I won't agree with everyone I talk to, but I respect anyone who believes in something enough to risk everything for it. Because history belongs to those willing to burn the boats. Episodes are out every other week wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. When last we left you, the heads were beginning to roll in Paris in the French Revolution, but the king still had his, and um, so did his wife, and we know that's not how this story ends up, so let's get to it, right? I guess. Um, In December, the trial of Louis XVI began, because of course, if he was no longer the king, there was no denying that he had committed 
some crimes against the, the nation, and they had to decide what to do with a king who wasn't a king anymore. Mm-hmm. Robespierre and his allies, um, loosely the political party was called the Jacobins. I'm just going to go with that. Okay. So Robespierre and other Jacobin members of the National Convention uh, were now calling themselves the Mountain and they were among like Game of Thrones. Um, yes, but this was because they literally sat very high in the room, like on the <laughs> highest of the benches. <laughs> Dumb. Okay. Yeah. Um, there were other guys called the Plain because they were across the. Uh, it was the mountain, the valley, and the plain because everybody sat, you know, with their friends. Well, I wouldn't want to be the Plain. They were the moderates. I guess the Mountain were among the strongest supporters of death for the king. And death decided by the convention without a further trial. There were kind of three options on the table. Louis is innocent. Louis gets a trial. Or we vote Louis to death now. Mm. Um, In a speech, Robespierre said, Yes, the death penalty is, in general, a crime, unjustifiable by the indestructible principles of nature, except in cases protecting the safety of individuals or the society altogether. Ordinary misdemeanors have never threatened public safety, because society may always protect itself by other means, making those culpable powerless to harm it. But for a king dethroned in the bosom of a revolution, which is as yet cemented only by laws, a king whose name attracts the scourge of war upon a troubled nation, neither prison nor exile can render his existence inconsequential to public happiness. This cruel exception to the ordinary laws avowed by justice can be imputed only to the nature of his crimes. With regret, I pronounce this (laughs) fatal truth. Louis must die. So the nation may live. I don't think he was very regretful. He wasn't regretful probably about very many things he did. He's a very interesting guy, though, because his politics were all like end slavery. Uh, everyone should be able to vote, including women. Um, he, he, you know, he, he he was just a bastard about it. Yeah. It, yes. <laughs> yes. And he also had this whole republic of virtue thing. It, nobody basically could be as virtuous as Robespierre. Yeah, of course. And that's eventually where his standards got up to. I wonder if that'll come back to bite him in the butt. Probably not. Hmm. When it came time for Louis's execution in early January, by the way, a royalist baron friend of the king raised like 300 men and had a plan to like rescue Louis on the way to the execution site, but only a couple of the guys showed up. Oh, no. So it fell through. The king was dressed by his own valet, uh, confessed by an Irish priest, and driven to the execution site in his own carriage. They did need to tie his hands, um, mostly so he wouldn't flinch or struggle and hurt himself worse on the scaffold. Mm-hmm. Um, per the son of Henry Sanson, the executioner. So one assistant waited with a rope, while another said to him, it is necessary to tie your hands. On hearing these unexpected words, and at the unexpected sight of that rope, Louis XVI made an involuntary gesture of repulsion. Never, he said, Never and pushed back the man holding the rope. The executioner then approached, quote, and said in the most respectful tone of voice imaginable, with a handkerchief, sire? At the word sire, which he had not heard for so long, Louis XVI winced, and at the same moment his confessor had addressed a few words to him from the carriage, said, So be it, then, that too, my God, and held out his hands. God, it's like me trying to put a collar on Poe. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Oh, no. Just wriggling out. Oh. Um, the executioner says, he came forward to speak, but there were shouts to the executioners to get on with their work. As he was strapped down, he exclaimed, my people, I die innocent. Then, turning towards his executioners, Louis the Sixteenth declared, gentlemen, I am innocent of everything of which I am accused. I hope that my blood may cement the good fortune of the French. The blade fell. It was 1022 a.m. One of the assistants of Sanson showed the head of Louis XVI to the people, whereupon a huge cry of Vive la nation! Vive la revolution! arose and an artillery salute rang out, which reached the ears of the imprisoned royal family. (sighs) Yeah, so, yeah, they they could hear the cheers over the death from where Marie Antoinette and her son were being held. And how old was her son? The Dauphin um, was only, I believe, I don't have this in front of me, I believe only about eight or or nine years old. He was a kid. Yeah. There were a couple, one or two other kids, right, that had escaped or something? Um, Yeah, she sent them off to live with family. Yeah, but this was the heir. This was the heir to the throne. This is Louis the 17th. Yeah, so. Oh, God. 
But at least there wasn't a revolutionary tribunal going on anymore. I mean... Well, in, in March of 1793, a couple months later, the war was going badly again. Uh, now the war also involved Britain and Spain, and all four of the enemies were calling themselves the First Coalition. Uh, they weren't calling it the First Coalition at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Just the Coalition? Yeah. <laughs> The convention raised a levee en masse, conscripting 300,000 men from across the country to form a whole new army because their army had literally been destroyed in the previous year's campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, there were also food shortages from several bad harvests, and that was made worse by the fact that the entire Vendée, remember the bread box of France, still being under revolt, the whole thing. Right. So they were starving before and they're starving now. Yes. And Parisians were once again demonstrating violently in the streets. Uh, and now it was the pro-war moderates who had gotten the whole Austria-Prussia thing started the previous year who they were uh, angry at. Hmm. On March 10th, a Jacobin named Georges Danton convinced the convention to bring back the Revolutionary Tribunal to try and once again assuage the mob justice that was taking uh, part in the streets. Danton's idea in his speech to the convention was like, you know, if we do it, it's not as bad as what'll happen if the mobs are doing it. And he literally said, let us be terrible so the people will not have to be. I, I'm i fine with you doing it in the house. <laughs> Just do it in the house. Exa oh, y yes, exactly. I don't want you getting in trouble out there. <laughs> The new Revolutionary Tribunal consisted of five judges, a prosecutor with two deputies, uh, all nominated by the convention, of course. So all strong um, Republican revolutionary political sentiments. Um, there would be 12 jurors for each trial, but these were always selected from reliably friendly political activists by the members of the tribunal. Um, there were no appeals on sentence. Whatever they decided went. However, in the first seven months, until September... 260 cases were heard by that tribunal, and 66 death penalties were handed down. I'm just surprised it wasn't all of them. Uh, it, it's, it's a little under 10 a month, beheadings. Hmm. It's, not, it's not too bad. It's a bargain at any price. Um, yeah, Danton, it turned out, was actually a bit of a voice for moderation on the Committee of Public Safety. Once things actually got rolling with this new tribunal, um, it seems he didn't when he saw the reaction to the use of force and also saw the use of force, he kind of lost his taste for both Ugh. and his conviction that it was really the, the right tool to be using right now. He was promptly ousted from the Committee of Public Safety, um, which had, when it was first created, mm -hmm. like a month before this, it was called the Danton Committee <laughs> because he was so much the head of it. Um, he was voted out and Robespierre was voted in and quickly became the head, more or less, of the Committee of Public Safety. You're saying the, the word head a lot. I think people are going to start losing them. Or keep losing them, I guess. Well, as I said, 66 death penalties had been handed down by September. And on September 17th of 1793, Jacobins in the National Convention passed the Law of Suspects to start to rep ramp things up. Yeah, things really need to be ramped up at this point. The law of suspects said that all suspect people in France were to be immediately arrested and brought before the Revolutionary Tribunal. So, who is suspect? I mean, who who was suspect in Salem? Anyone they wanted to be. Oh, but, but this is all legal, Carrie. The bill gives specific crimes that you need to be hauled in for. So here are the crimes. Uh, the, the people, the suspects. Bad vibes. Uh, partisans of tyranny or federalism and enemies of freedom. Um, public officials who had been suspended or fired from their positions at any point by the National Convention. Let's bring them in. Um, just in case we want to, you know, have a word with them. Former nobles and families of fled nobles who hadn't, quote, satisfactorily demonstrated their commitment to the revolution. Um, and... Of course, the ever-popular vagabonds and tax evaders. It's so vague. How do you... I mean, it's, it's a different opinion everywhere as to how you sufficiently demonstrate your commitment to the revolution. Well, exactly right. And it really led to the reign of terror. This whole thing is broadly called the reign of terror. And a lot of people... It might have started when the tribunal started and the Committee of Public Safety was formed. Um, but it might start right here with the Law of Suspects in September 1793, because this is where the arrests ramp up by, like, like crazy. 
Um, the estimates of those arrested under this law over the following year, because this law will be disused and the tribunal will be over by July of 1794. Mm-hmm. And in that time, um, estimates are that between 200,000 and 500,000 people were arrested under the law of suspects. That's so many people. <laughs> uh, less than you would think were actually guillotined. But but all the people that were sentenced to death from that were guillotined. Yes. Um, in Paris. There were a few other... Was it the same guillotine? Yes. Man. They had the one... That thing's sturdy. They don't make them like that anymore. Well, I think they made some other guillotines for uh, some of the provisional counts, like in... Like travel size. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you put it in your case and you go. <laughs> no, you needed a separate guillotine for like, you know, the... Uh, provisional tribunals in other parts of the country while they were still going on. Mm -hmm. Now, as I said, the Girondins, the politically moderate pro-war guys who had gotten the country into this whole um, Austrian mess, had fallen out of favor um, in the face of continuing political currents toward more and more um, liberal extremes and democratic extremes and the very, very bad wars that they had started and were blamed for, and um, that a lot of people said they were losing on purpose to try to bring the king back. None of these guys wanted to bring the king back, for <laughs> sure. Right. Um, and in a, in a kind of a self-defense move, they tried to bring a tribunal case against Jean-Paul Marat. Remember the guy, the journalist who organized the September massacres? Mm-hmm. They said, this guy is fomenting all kinds of violence. Once again, uh, we, should, we should maybe chop his head off. It'd solve a lot of problems. <laughs> Uh, Marat was a deputy in the convention, so he was immune, and so accusing him sort of by default stripped the immunity away from other deputies. Right. And he easily got off because the Committee of Public Safety was dominated by his buddies, Um, and then 22 Girondins were immediately accused by the Committee of Public Safety. They got off that time, but they would try again later that fall, and 22 of the foremost moderate leaders in the convention were removed from their seats and then guillotined in October 1793. So now it's just what you do to political opponents in revolutionary France. Yeah. Yeah. Also tried in October 1793, our old friend Marie Antoinette. Yeah. The charges against the queen included orchestrating orgies in Versailles. I don't think that would be up to her, even if she did. Sending millions of livres from the national treasury to Austria to her, uh, you know, hated Habsburg family. Well, her brother was the Holy Roman Emperor. Mm -hmm. He probably didn't need the money from her. Well, no, but the idea was sending them money so that the Austrians would bring in military aid. Right. Which she was doing. (laughs) Uh, Planning a 1792 betrayal and massacre of National Guardsmen. She may or may not have had anything to do with that. She did several times order the National Guard to fire on crowds. Um... Declaring her son king of France. She did try to do that. Um, And incest against that very same son. Now, Marie Antoinette almost certainly didn't do this. And this is, even amongst all of the stuff we're saying, and even amongst the fact that I don't really like Marie Antoinette very much, this is one of the more despicable things in the revolution. Well, they did the same thing to Anne Boleyn. Um, They trotted out, of course, uh, Louis Charles... The, the heir to the the once heir to the throne had been taken away from Marie Antoinette after his father's death and was now being raised by a um, kind of a, a gruff revolutionary tradesman who was supposed to give the boy a good revolutionary upbringing. Um, but he was mostly at this point just beating him and uh, forcing him to uh, testify against his mother for sexual abuse. Yeah, and then eventually he was going to be murdered because they can't keep him alive. Um, maybe... Louis Charles was not murdered, though. Really? No, he just um, died in obscurity in a French prison cell of, like, cholera or something. Well, like, okay. I knew he died. (laughs) So, I mean, you know. They didn't have to execute him. They just kind of forgot about him. Uh, They killed him by cholera. In in any case, uh, the horrible character smear and the trauma for that child, and I can't imagine the trauma for Marie Antoinette, of all this uh, trial aside, she was ultimately convicted of depleting the national treasury, conspiracy against the security of the state, and high treason. But of course, all you really needed was that last one to get a sentence of death. 
listen, was she a good person? Probably not. Was she very frivolous and the worst kind of wealthy person in the world? Yes. Was she a traitor to France? Yes. After she wasn't, though. I mean, to her, she wasn't a traitor because she believed in the king. You know? But when the country doesn't believe in the king anymore, she was standing in the way of the national sovereignty of the people. Yeah, and that's going so well. All I'm saying is that I don't think she deserved to die. I don't think she should have been queen, but, you know. I think many of the revolutionaries would have agreed with you. Robespierre, for example, thought she had to die and deserved to die. But I think a lot of the convention probably thought, well, she probably should die to clean things up for this revolution a little bit and and leave less um, counter-revolutionary royalist threads hanging around. Some of them probably thought she probably needs to die because the people hate her so much that they'll kill us with the guillotine if we don't guillotine her. Yeah. Marie Antoinette was allowed to write a letter to her sister-in-law confirming her clear conscience and religious faith, though the letter would never be delivered. Mm. Her will, by the way, was found amongst a, a bunch of Robespierre's papers after his death. The a dickhead. <laughs> Truly, in mm. all ways. Um, Marie Antoinette was forced into a plain white dress. Her hair was cut short. Her hair, by the way, was all white now. It had, and she wasn't that old. It had turned, according to one of her servants, it had turned in one night um, during, the, during the, I think, the Women's March on Versailles when every woman from Paris tried to murder the queen all at once. Mm. Yeah. They didn't like her. (laughs) Yeah. The queen's hands were bound by a rope leash as she was transported to the execution site in an open cart. And of course, that means abuse being heaped on her all the way, people jeering. It's so much worse than Louis. Oh, far worse. Um, A constitutional priest was assigned to confess the queen, um, but she ignored him as he rode beside her in this open cart all the way, just trying to get her to, uh, you know, Trying to do the trying to do his job, swatting away tomatoes. Um, but because he had sworn an oath to the revolution, she refused to even speak to him. She was guillotined at twelve fifteen p.m. Marie Antoinette's last words were, "Pardon me, sir. I did not mean to do it." She had uh, just stepped on the executioner's toe. Mm. What was she actually guilty of, Carrie? Um, she did bribe a lot of, again, she bribed government officials to make that last constitution as conservative and, and, uh, 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 you know, good for the king and bad for the people as possible. But was that her choice or just something that she was sent to do? She had repeatedly actively tried to cajole her family members in Austria to come and, uh, you know, rescue the monarchy. I mean, yeah, I'd be like, hey, bro. I'm going to get guillotined. Hello. Yeah, but read the room, Marie. We've obviously decided the monarchy's a crime. <sighs> I mean, she obviously needed rescuing, so I don't think she was all wrong. <laughs> she got murdered. She was terminally bad at reading the room. Yes. And we can say that about so many of these people. Um, it's interesting that we've talked about two royals uh, killed by the guillotine today, and we will talk about so many more revolutionaries who were killed by the guillotine. The, um, That's how it goes. Yeah, the, what they say about the French Revolution is that she devoured her children. We could say that about Madame la Guillotine as well. Mm. It wasn't until the following year, 1794, that the true terror, the Great Terror, began. Okay. In March of 1794, our friend Georges Danton, he who had uh, started the tribunal and then immediately wanted out. Mm-hmm. Danton was working together. He had really had a falling out with Robespierre at this point and was working together with journalist Camille Desmoulins on a newspaper attacking the Committee of Public Safety and Robespierre and calling for an end to the terror and an end to the aggressive de-Christianization that was happening in Paris and across France. Because at this point, they were also um, running into Catholic churches and smashing up all the crosses and replacing them with like busts of scientists. Mm hmm. The French Revolution was goofy like that. Dramatic. Um, Danton had also recently been implicated in an insider trading and fraud scam involving the East India Company. And Robespierre seized the opportunity to frame that as not just a financial crime, but a counter-revolutionary conspiracy with Danton's supposed British and Dutch masters. Mm -hmm. This is, again, a guy who I think was a French patriot, if a corrupt politician i don't think there was any conspiracy involved here except where there was one uh, a convenient one to be had for robespierre 
In any case, uh, Desmoulins and Danton and 13 other guys, either involved in the scandal or the newspaper or just friends of Danton, were tried starting April 3rd, and every one of them was guillotined on April 5th. Because trials were getting shorter and shorter in Robespierre's uh, Revolutionary Tribunal. Yeah. Man. It was shortly after this that the Committee of Public Safety, which was now kind of acting as an arm of Robespierre. If I say Committee of Public Safety, you might as well say that Maximilian Robespierre did it, as far as the histories of the revolution paint it. Mm -hmm. The Committee of Public Safety shut down all of the provincial tribunals, all of the ones out in the country, to bring all of the trials and all of the executions in Paris. Consistent. Because they noticed that in some places the... uh, terror was maybe being conducted too aggressively and in other places the terror was not being conducted aggressively enough and it's like well if you're not cutting off heads what are you doing what are you doing um one thing robespierre said once to a guy who was like i think we're cutting off too many heads and robespierre (laughs) said like ah they want us to have a revolution without a revolution okay max keep that same energy um with all their opposition out of the way robespierre and the allies were um bringing the tribunal closer to home and running it directly out of Paris. Again, Robespierre thought he was creating a, quote, republic of virtue. He used that phrase a lot, and he thought that they wouldn't get there until they basically killed all of the unvirtuous people in France. Mm. In May of 1794, he said, The basis of popular government in time of revolution is both virtue and terror. Terror without virtue is murderous. A virtue without terror is powerless. Terror is nothing else than swift, severe, indomitable justice. It flows, then, from virtue. I don't know. This guy, this guy kind of sucks, though. Ye- oh, yeah. You're not alone <laughs> in thinking that. He's the villain of this whole piece. He's, uh... He reminds me of the guy from Hunchback of Notre Dame. Frollo. Uh- Well, lots of people in France were starting to get really scared of Maximilien Robespierre, almost regardless of what side of the political fence they were on. Well, it's almost like he's a dictator. Uh, He was, yeah, the Committee of Public Safety had absolute dictatorial power at this point. So is that any better than a monarchy? (laughs) Uh, No, but there's an idea that you have to, he thinks, if we can take him at his word, he thinks he's safeguarding the revolution until... You know, he knows what the country's supposed to be. And he's just, there's all these people who haven't figured it out yet. And he's just, if he can just kill enough of them, everybody else is going to figure it out. And then eventually everyone's going to figure out that he needs to be the leader. Yeah, I think he might think that. I don't know. He, maybe he's trying to make himself a god. I don't think he's trying to make himself a god. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Hold on. <sighs> Lots of people agreed with you, Carrie, because on May 25th, there was an attempt on Robespierre's life. Um, and... Two days before that, on May 23rd, there was an attempt on Jean-Marie Collot de Bois's life. Uh, I haven't mentioned him yet. Doesn't matter. He was another Jacobin and another member of the Committee of Public Safety. There were also just so many prisoners all of a sudden in Paris to deal with now. It's like, ah, where, where did all these prisoners come from? Take my prisoner, please. Because, you know, you guys passed the law of suspects and then you said, oh, we're going to try all of the prisoners here. And so now Paris's jails were literally overflowing. Yeah, up to half a million people, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And on top of all that, and maybe worse than that, Robespierre suspected there might still be a couple of guys around Paris who still kind of liked Georges Danton. So if I kill everyone, I'm bound to kill those guys, too. Well, not maybe not everyone. On June 10th, Robespierre ally Georges Couton... He was another one of these like like rabid Jacobin um, uh, members of the Committee of Public Safety, big on head chopping. Um, Georges Couton was uh, bound to a wheelchair by like a, I think a childhood disease, mm-hmm. but it, he well, he was not not a murderer. <laughs> he loved he loved chopping heads. He introduced <laughs> the law of twenty two prairial on June tenth. Um, twenty two prairial was the date because by this time they had also abolished the regular calendar and made up their own because the French Revolution is goofy. If you care about that, we can do a supplemental on it. We've talked about calendars before. <laughs> yes, it's our bedroom talk. <laughs> so uh Georges Couton introduced the law of twenty two prairial, but it is strongly suspected or at least strongly suggested in histories from around that time that Robespierre was behind the spirit, if not all of the wording of this law. Um, It basically said that the tribunal, it added a few new crimes, right? 
So the tribunal could now try you for slandering patriotism, seeking to inspire discouragement, spreading false news, fake news, uh, depraving morals, corrupting public conscience, and impairing the purity and energy of the revolutionary government. You're going to tell me Maximilian Robespierre didn't write those? Oh, for sure he did. For sure he did. Um, The law also said, and this is big, that all citizens must speak up if they saw other citizens not being revolutionary enough. If you see something... Say something. Um, Or, as Georges Couton said, maybe less catchily, uh, for a citizen to become suspect, it is sufficient that rumor accuses him. Mm, We gotta get a copywriter on this. The law also shortened the clock on revolutionary trials because they were just taking too long, right? So now you would get a three-day trial maximum, and the defense would get no counsel and no attempt to present their case. There would also only be two verdicts from now on, innocence or death. (laughs) Okay. This law was known also, at the time and now, as the law of the Great Terror. Yeah. And from here until Robespierre's fall, which was a, like just a couple months later, uh, something, okay, so in the last month before Robespierre's fall, this is the pace that it had gotten up to, mm-hmm. something close to 800 people were guillotined in Paris. That's a lot. I mean, when we talked about the first tribunal, I think we were doing 10 a month, right? Yeah. Now it's multiple a day. Yeah. L- thankfully, Robespierre would fall less than two months later. Um, and as we come to the end of the terror, we'll get to his fall in a second. Let's talk about the, the death tolls. Uh, like I said, 200 to 500,000 people arrested under the suspect laws. There were 16, they kept very good records, actually. Um, there were 16,594 official death sentences passed in Paris, passed in France, sorry, from June of 93 to July of 94. So about 17,000 people guillotined. And then an estimated 10,000 more deaths in prison. Mm -hmm. Illness, all that stuff. The prisons were not sanitary. And especially toward the end, they were literally overcrowded. Mm -hmm. Because they had moved every prisoner in France there. Um, not everyone, you asked if everyone was guillotined, um, out in the country, not everyone was, they would send, uh, what they called representatives on mission from the national convention out to a given province to just deal with stuff with complete dictatorial powers. We don't have time to deal with the revol- with the government over there. They have a local government that they've set up since the revolution, but you just go tell them what to do. You've got unlimited power. Cool. That always works out well. And the representative on mission, one of the representatives on mission in the Vendée, where everything was going crazy with all the um, counter-revolution and such, uh, this guy's name was Jean-Baptiste Carrier, and he loved killing priests. (laughs) It was his favorite. And um, so, non-juring priests and suspected counter-revolutionaries were killed in the Vendée at like a much faster rate than people were being killed in Paris. Mm. Um, of the 16 or 17,000 beheadings, something like between two and 3,000 of those happened in Paris. Um, most of them happened out around the countryside. An estimated 1,500 to 4,000 people, I've sometimes seen numbers like 9,000 in histories you're always going to get in anything, right? Army counts from the Roman times and stuff. You always get one number that's crazy. Yeah. The crazy number here is 9,000. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, usually they say between 1,500 and 4,000 people were drowned in the Vendée. They mm. would load, and they would do this about once a week, it sounds like. Well, uh, Jean-Baptiste Carrier... It's drowning day. They would load 50 to 100 priests. Um, later, also nuns, and uh, even later, they would just start throwing some random prisoners in with them because they were running out of priests, and they really liked these drownings. Oh, God. Uh, they would load them onto a specially equipped barge that was designed to have a plug pulled out and then just sink. And these people couldn't swim. Right. Uh, there was one guy. I read an account of one guy who actually escaped from one of these executions because he was able to swim and then he just got away. There were two other guys who escaped or were rescued by sailors on a nearby boat and then they were taken back and just thrown into the next drowning. Jesus. Oh, God. Uh, The revolutionaries, these were priests who refused to take that oath I mentioned before, where they liked the country better than God. Yeah. Um, Jeering revolutionaries called these 
drownings, Republican baptisms. <laughs> oh, God. Um, like I said, nuns also would fall victim. Sometimes they would strip the priests and the nuns nude and shackle them together um, like face to face before the drowning. Um, and they would call that a Republican wedding. Uh, this is sick. It's a lot worse than the guillotine. Yeah. And again, I think like 4,000 people that happened to. Oof. The law of Prairie Al made people uncomfortable. And Robespierre was, um, meanwhile, trying to replace Christianity with something called the cult of the supreme being. And let me guess who that supreme being was gonna be. Well, I'm not saying he placed himself at the center of that cult, but they did have this giant celebration where everyone had was required to go, and then Robespierre, wearing a golden robe, led all the other deputies of the government up the top of a giant paper mache mountain they had built, where they all sang patriotic hymns together under a statue of Hercules. Have you ever seen that picture <laughs> <laughs> of Kirk Cameron? Oh, I thought you were going to say Rudy Giuliani at the... Uh, Four Seasons? Yeah, at the Four Seasons. No, it's a picture of Kirk Cameron, uh, who you may remember from Growing Pains. Of course. He's an evangelist and kind of an asshole. I, I don't know what Growing Pains is, but you're talking about the star of the um, Left Behind series? Yes. Boner's friend, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a picture of him that I think he posted celebrating his birthday, like at an office is this after growing pains years when is this this is it's probably like 10 years ago now but it's heavy into his left behind years so to speak and it's basically like a couple of subway sandwiches and then like a couple of older ladies standing in the doorway and it's the most awkward unpleasant seeming birthday ever <laughs> and i imagine that this parade of, of Robespierre celebrating Robespierre went very much like Kirk Cameron's Subway sandwich birthday. You think the, 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 the reactions were the same? Yes. Let me, let me find this picture for you. Um, so that was the, the cult of the supreme being. Because again, they had been, this de-Christianization thing was a big part of the revolution too. And uh, Robespierre agreed with uh, some of his fellow politicians that it had gone too far when they drowned all those priests in the Vendée. So maybe we don't need to get rid of all religion, but uh, hey, let's just let's just worship a I don't know. A, does anyone know a supreme being uh, that we could you know find? Uh, so I found this on the Reddit r sad cringe. So that should tell you something. Oh, that's tough. Yeah, no, this is uh, it, it, is this before the time of COVID because they are giving. Oh him no, big, this is a while ago. They're giving him big social distance. Yeah, it's it's tough. This lady just lurking, yeah. sadly. She doesn't look like he knows she's there. She looks like she's stalking. She, This lady who is Carrie, this so is bad. far away. This is bad radio. Our <laughs> listeners cannot see this picture. Please look up. Um, I found it under Kirk Cameron Subway Sandwich Birthday. There you have it. And then <laughs> and you'll be looking at a pretty good uh, you know, version of the Festival of the Supreme Being. Yeah. So after the Festival of the Supreme Being, um, Robespierre came in and made a really creepy, scary, paranoid speech on July 26th. And at this point in his career, he would like take ill. He would have a panic attack and fall nervously ill for like two weeks to a month and just leave for Paris for a while uh, and then come back. And when he came back, he would be even crazier than last time. Uh, and in this particular time, June, uh, July 26th, he gave a really uh, paranoid speech in which he said more heads definitely have to be chopped and some of them are in this room and i have a list of heads that need to be chopped but i'm not going to read it right now yeah that's not the vibe uh so if you want to live the following day the convention arrested robespierre couton robespierre's brother and two other jacobin members of the committee of public safety his brother's name's crouton no no, no. couton remember george couton the guy in the wheelchair Oh. Augustine is the name of Robespierre's brother. Oh, I think Couton, his brother. <laughs> it's like Crouton Robespierre. That's tough. So July 27th, they arrest these five guys. They bring them. Yeah, Bergen Fries. <laughs> <laughs> you gave me the look. I did. Uh, they bring them to a jail. Actually, they're like five separate prisons. But I guess the jailers were like, 
What do you mean it's Robespierre? It's, this is Robespierre. He's like almost the president. He's basically the president. We can't put him in jail. He's the supreme being. We just had a party about it. Yeah, we don't believe you. So they couldn't be taken to prison. So instead, they were they um, were kind of sort of left to their, not left to their own devices. Everyone knew where they were. They were in the Hotel de Ville, um, surrounded by like just a few. There were some Parisians, some angry Parisians gathering outside saying, we love Robespierre. Um, but they weren't that into it, and they kind of dispersed by, <laughs> by, by you know, a little after sundown. Mm. And then 4,000 um, men raised by the National Convention came to actually, you know, bring the five conspirators, the five Robespierreists, if you will, into custody. Mm-hmm. Are you following? I'm following. And this is what they found inside City Hall. Uh, Georges Couton, he of the wheelchair and of the... Prairie Owl Law was found lying in a corner at the bottom of the staircase, having tumbled out of his wheelchair in a panic as he, uh, you know, tried to flee the building. And was he alive? At this point. Okay. Robespierre's brother, Augustine, and another guy named Henriot uh, tried to shimmy across a window ledge to escape the building like they were Ethan Hunt. Mm-hmm. Um, Augustine fell onto several bayonets and apparently <laughs> at least one guy. And Henrio fell onto a bunch of shards of glass and then dragged himself to a nearby sewer. Ugh. Uh, Henrio actually wouldn't be found until 12 hours later, upon which he begged the revolutionaries who found him to just shoot him. And they were like, no, they this like, is more fun. Yeah, that's not what we do. Ugh. <sighs> Committee member Leba killed himself with a pistol. And before he did, he handed another pistol to Robespierre. Maximilian Robespierre probably had never held a gun in his life, if I had to guess. And he almost certainly tried to kill himself. <laughs> oh, God. What we know is that when troops burst in, his uh, lower jaw was split and shattered by a bullet. So it looks an awful lot like he put the pistol under his jaw, pulled the trigger, and just succeeded in blowing off half of his own lower jaw. (sighs) Jesus. There was another guy named Louis St. Just who had been part of all of this. Uh, He was, I only mentioned him because he was the only one taken into custody, just kind of stoically not saying anything. With his whole jaw. And with his whole jaw, not writhing in pain. Yep. Okay. Well, pistol guy definitely got off easiest. He did, because Robespierre lay on a table outside the Committee of General Security all night long. Uh, Georges Couton and Augustine Robespierre were taken to a hospital around 5 p.m., but the best anyone would do for Max was to send a military doctor to, quote, remove some of the teeth and bone fragments, end quote, from his face. Mm -hmm. When he was moved to a cell, Robespierre was placed on the same bed where Danton had, a- had awaited his execution. Oh, how the turntables <laughs> turn. The following day, Robespierre and 21 of his allies were tried for counter-revolution. The average age of, me- of these men was 34. Oh, happy birthday, Sean. Happy birthday, Sean. Another thing I thought about while putting these notes together. <laughs> These uh, average age 34-year-old men were loaded into three carts. A mob followed and screamed insults at them all the way. The new form of the latest form of the Revolutionary Tribunal was just you were tried on the scaffold and then either they chopped your head off or let you go. Robespierre's eyes were actually swollen shut all the way through the procession to the execution. Couton had to be, they didn't let him have his wheelchair, so instead they had to tie him to a wooden board to carry him up the scaffold and feed him into the machine. Oh, God. But it took 15 minutes to secure him to the board um, over his agonizing screams of pain. Had he, like, broken bones and stuff? I'm sure he had, yeah. I yeah. think he tumbled down those stairs. Oof. And finally we come to Robespierre's final moments. In order to get a clean view of his work, the executioner pulled the bloody rag off of Robespierre's face. He let out, Robespierre that is, let out a shrill, shrieking howl of pain that was cut off by the fall of the blade. The applause continued for 15 straight minutes. What is he, Patty Lapone? <laughs> Jesus. Well, n- not because of the manner of death. I think the applause is mostly because he's he's gone, and it means it really marked pretty much instantly the end of 
the terror. There were still more killings, uh, kind of reactionary killings to in what was called the white terror. Um, a bunch of the, you know, now it was the liberals being killed instead of the conservatives. Um, but there were less killings and uh, uh, things were really starting to peter out at that point. Mm-hmm. And that's the guillotine in the French Revolution. It's also been used, um, of course, as a death sentence in other European countries. Uh, Germany, Switzerland, Greece, and Sweden have used it at different points in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, But they generally discontinued it before the French did. As I said, the French executed the last official, you know, state execution with a guillotine was in 77. It's like the same year Star Wars came out. Um, Yes, it is. I'm still... (laughs) My dad was... My parents were alive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the guillotine, of course, made its way to French territories. The only places it was really used in the Western Hemisphere were places that used to be owned by France, and therefore they were using guillotines while the French government was there. Never in America. Uh, never in America. The Nazis guillotined about 16,000 people, mostly political prisoners and resistance fighters. Um, and the guillotine still tends to crop up in any situation where people are drafting revolutionary tribunals and show trials. It's just kind of an appropriate part of the window dressing. In 1996, a Georgia lawmaker introduced a bill to replace the electric chair with the guillotine as the state's preferred method of execution. That bill didn't go anywhere. No, we like to see people zapped to death and cooked from the inside. Yeah, That's much better. We like when their hair lights on fire and their eyeballs melt. Yeah, like they're in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Like you'd much rather be guillotined than electric chaired, right? Oh, yes. Yes. Or lethal injection. Yes, but I think people who don't have to see it think it's not as gruesome. But can we, I mean, as far as executions go... It's not a bad one. I th- I think it, the I, guillotine. It, yeah, if I was going to be executed, I think a pistol behind the ear is the way to go. But that for some reason, governments seem to shy away from that too. Um, I think the guillotine. Well, is their, they do is the firing best. squad, but they also do it as a squad. And I think they shoot. So you no the, one knows. And they shoot you like in the torso, don't they? They're shooting all over. I think. Yeah, I one it, sh- once in the head. That's the, that's the way to go. Yeah, it's again that kind of very direct version of killing. Mm-hmm. It's like throwing a switch or injecting someone. You're not doing the killing. And even guns don't kill people. People kill people. You're pulling the trigger on the gun. That's. I mean, it's not that different. But for some reason, it's just so much more direct seeming, I guess. That's probably why a few people in not too in more recent years, have chosen the guillotine as a method of suicide, which I was surprised to find. Oh. In December of 1999, a 57-year-old London widower who had given up work to take care of his wife following her brain hemorrhage used pliers to cut the retaining wire on a homemade guillotine in his backyard. Oh, God. Lopping his own head cleanly off less than four months after his wife had died. Mm. In April 2003, a Northumberland builder uh, killed him, himself with a homemade guillotine. Uh, this was a guy who had lived with his father, and they worked together on a family construction business. And uh, he, he stayed home over a Christmas holiday, and then his father heard a noise that he thought was a chimney falling down. So sad, these stories. This was a complex device that apparently took weeks to construct, and the coroner said, quote, the complicated mechanism was primed to switch itself on at 3.30 a.m. and cause a blade to fall on Mr. Taylor's neck. Wow. And finally, in June 2010, a 47-year-old living with his parents in Moscow, who had been despondent for years over a divorce, apparently, spent all one night working with the door locked. His mother later said, uh, he was always building something. This time he said he was building a closet. His homemade guillotine was built out of plywood, sheet metal, and water bottles. And he was found in the morning partially decapitated. Police say he just likely couldn't sharpen the blade enough without tipping off his parents downstairs as to what was going on. (sighs) God. I had to note those because they blew my mind. Uh, I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Yeah. Suicide by guillotine. There you go. 
Um, and those were the most recent uses of guillotines that I could find, actually. So uh, other than, you know, cutting uh, watermelons in half on, on YouTube. Right. And cabbages to, to demonstrate cutting a woman in half as a uh, magician on the stage. <laughs> so there you have it, Carrie. Uh, we've been talking about people, about lopping people's heads off for over an hour now. <laughs> yeah. Happy birthday. What are your thoughts on Madame la Guillotine? Well, I wouldn't kill myself this way. No. But if I had to be executed, you know, death penalty or whatever, not a bad way to do it, I think. I wouldn't trust myself to build it, though. No, and no one should do that. Yeah. I would want to see a demo before I went in. Well, and at least you want uh, some professional consulting involved. You, 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 This is not something that you, a project that you just take on yourself and... Uh, I mean, learn from the French Revolution in, in this place, if no other. But probably more than this place. Refer it to a committee. Well, I don't know if that's what you should take away from that. It's true crime time. The dead have risen. Well, in a way. After a record decade-long drought, human remains have begun to emerge in Nevada's Lake Mead, one of the largest reservoirs in the United States. Oh, uh, for a second I was trying to parse that sentence. I thought you meant a decades-long drought of human remains being found, and it's like, (laughs) up, they're back! (laughs) Yeah, uh, water levels have been plummeting for years in Lake Mead, and on May 1st, The historic lows revealed a gruesome hidden secret from beneath the surface, a metal barrel containing a corpse that had been dumped in the lake over 30 years ago. It doesn't sound sanitary. No. What? Doesn't sound like something I'd want to find. Yeah, yeah, no. No one wants to find a corpse in a barrel, Sean. Some people do. Unless it's Jimmy Hoffa, and then you're at least known as the person who found Jimmy Hoffa in a barrel. Um, I seem to remember a uh, person in a barrel, a little person named Toot and Common being found in a barrel, and that being a big deal. That was a sarcophagus in a pyramid. (laughs) (laughs) You're an idiot. Less than a week later, on May 7th, human skeletal remains were reported by two sisters paddleboarding near a sandbar in Lake Mead's Colville Bay, and they were retrieved by NPS rangers. The remains appear to only consist of a human jawbone with attached teeth. The Clark County Medical Examiner stated at this time there is no evidence to suggest foul play for this body, because again, it is just a jawbone, but the same cannot be said for the first. Is the jawbone the hardest bone? Why are people always finding jawbones? Or do you think that's just the most recognizably human bone that there is? I don't know. Asks Robespierre. <laughs> He, come on, he has less that less jaw than the rest of us. Well, his wasn't sturdy, I guess. The clothing of the body in the barrel suggests the person died around the mid-70s to the early 80s, and LVMPD Homicide Section Lieutenant Ray Spencer said in a statement that, quote, we believe this is a homicide as a result of a gunshot wound. Spencer also said that the victim's identity is so far unknown, but the Clark County Coroner's Office will release information once it becomes available. Lake Mead provides water for more than 40 million people and also happens to be a short drive away from Las Vegas, which leads many to suspect that it has been a dumping ground for mafia victims for years. In barrels. Yeah, sure. Well, it could be in barrels, could be loose, could be all different kinds of ways. And I think we're going to see all those different ways play out uh, as this drought continues. Oh my God. So you you are planting your flag right here. This isn't going to be the last one of these. Absolutely not. No. No. As Las Vegas Mayor Oscar Goodman told the Associated Press rather ghoulishly, there's no telling what we'll find in Lake Mead. It's not a bad place to dump a body. All right. Thank you, Mayor Goodman. This is... (laughs) This is a mayor who's living in the real world. Well, he's living somewhere. And uh, yeah, we'll keep you posted on what's going to keep on happening, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Mm. It's just like a, like a soup out there. Ew. Ew. 
That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary. And check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash ain'titscary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and also now on Spotify. We'll be forever grateful. We certainly will. Uh, special thanks to our beloved top-tier patrons, uh, the folks who are already joining us over there. Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, Maria Ferrante, Robin McCabe, Comfy Mike, Alex Nakutis, Ryan Regan, and Christy Atchison. Thank you very much, guys, and we love you. See you next Thursday. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe, music by Kyle Ryan, and you can find Kyle at his YouTube channel, Music is a Verb. Ain't It Scary has been brought to you by Killer Podcasts and is a production of Longboy Media. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Burn the Boats from Evergreen Podcasts. I interview political leaders and influencers, folks like award-winning journalist Soledad O'Brien and conservative columnist Bill Kristol about the choices they confront when failure is not an option. I won't agree with everyone I talk to, but I respect anyone who believes in something enough to risk everything for it. Because history belongs to those willing to burn the boats. Episodes are out every other week wherever you get your podcasts.